Okay, so I don't know if this is going to be lame. I've never done a reaction video. Um, in general, I kind of think they're dumb. But I wanted to show you some thoughts as they come to something like this when I see it. It might be insightful. It might be maybe some off-topic rabbit trails. And I'm also kind of curious to see about this, this Behringer thing. So there's been a lot of talk about it. Honestly, I don't understand the hype. It's a 33609 clone. Cool. <laughs> you know? But, yeah, let's see what this thing's about, and I'll give my reaction kind of as we, as we go along here. Every now and again, a piece of gear comes along that changes the game. Decades ago, one such compressor became the heartbeat of countless hit records, loved for its unique character and precise dynamic control. Today, we're going to be looking at a new piece of gear inspired by that very legend, the Behringer 369. Okay, so honestly, I didn't know that it was such a legend, but um, to me, the 33609 was like the mastering compressor that was easy to overdo and squash your mixes. But he's talking about, you know, pushing it, and I, I kind of skipped around, and he, he does push it, and that is, it's pretty interesting. I never thought of using this thing the way he does it, so I'm kind of curious to learn a few maybe cool techniques. Back in the day, this compressor was everywhere, from major studios like Abbey Road, Sound City, Air Studios, Sunset Sound, and Capitol Studios, to name a few. Used on vocals, drums, guitars, pianos, mix buses. Its ability to add that perfect punch without muddying the mix made it a favorite amongst top producers. Butch Vig with Nirvana, Chris Lord Alge with Green Day, and the man referred to as the fifth Beatle, George Martin. They blurred the penis, by the way. It's made its mark across all genres, from rock to pop, influence. See, I, I don't know if it's made its mark I don't know, has it? I mean, 1176 has, LA2A has, right? But I don't know. It kind of reminds me of the UAD commercials where it's like all of a sudden, whatever that is, it's like the most amazing thing that ever came out. And it's like, okay, I get it. I get it. But um, yeah, they're doing a great job. I mean, I'd like to know more, like some of the depth of the story is that like, okay, if it's made its mark, where? Like, what albums? Like, I'm, I'm really curious now, actually. Seeing the sound of music as we know it. The magic was in its musicality and the warmth that it brought to recordings. And when really pushed, the unique character and grit it stamped upon them. So Behringer has been working. Yeah, so I've never been able to push uh, the plugin. Um, I have some clones that are kind of related. And they sound cool, but again, it's not something that I think of pushing, you know? Uh, this compressor has been known to be a favorite among, like, stereo bus compressors on low ratios. That's, like, its, its thing. Uh, at least I think. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's the kind of vibe that I hear people talking about, is low ratios, 1.5 to 1, 3 to 1, you know? to produce an homage inspired by the original's characteristics at a price point that is so much more affordable. 500 bucks, okay? So, worth looking into. First off, the Behringer 369 features a total of six custom-built Midas transformers. Like the original unit, there are two input transformers, two intermediate transformers, and two output transformers. So that's good because they didn't skimp on the transformers. I don't know the quality of them, but sounds like, I mean, honestly, the technology and audio is so much more primitive than, than where technology is today. So I wouldn't be surprised if they could absolutely nail this, you know? Um, and they put six transformers, that's the costliest part. I know Heritage Audio put six transformers in their 33609 clone. So, yeah, it's good they have a lot of transformers in it. These are key for maintaining pristine audio fidelity. The characteristic warmth and enhanced dynamics brought about by quality transformers contribute significantly to the depth and richness of audio output, the kind of characteristic that can only be achieved with top tier components. The 369. Okay, so it's saying that, saying that they're using top tier components. So. I guess my question is, how in the world is it so cheap? Or, 
How is the other one so expensive? But something doesn't make sense, you know? Um, maybe it's, uh, I don't know, maybe it's just done at scale, but again, it's like, why is certain gear so expensive or how in the world did other companies make it so cheap? So sometimes it's um, like layers, like distribution layer, right? And then the retail layer. And each time you go through, then you essentially double the price. So a $600 um, 1176 clone might only be $150 to make, you know, you double the price for distribution, double it again for retail, you know, it kind of happens like that, I guess, but. Ensures a completely discrete signal path. This means each component in the signal chain, channels in a stereo pair are synchronized. Okay, I want to skip ahead. This looks interesting. And there, there might be, um, there might be something interesting going on here because according to the manual, this tandem control voltage, it's a 15 pin D sub and it looks like it has the channel two control voltage and channel one control voltage, which means that it could be a side chain. You could rig it up to be a side chain with uh, a 15, put, 15 pin adapter uh, cable. So this is cool. This could be actually an amazing like utility compressor for somebody like me who wants to use something decent for dialogue and and not have to worry about broken down gear. Um, yeah, let's keep watching. In phase and react identically to dynamics. Finally, the units housed in a rugged 2U rack some track some classic compression techniques such as stacking. Let's have a look at the limiter first. Let's we'll start with some drums. You've got a switch for the variable attack times. The slower will allow more transients through. So if you need a more percussive and impactful sound, that's where you want that set. For faster, it's going to be attacking the transients and controlling the signal. For stacking, that's kind of what we need. So, Yeah, I'd agree with that. Fast attack means it's going to chop off those transients. Interesting choice, though, starting off with the limit side of things. So straight away, you can see the meat is engaged and they're starting to pull that attack down. So I'm gonna look for something fairly subtle here to begin with, with a fast release time. On this unit, it classically was called recovery. This is an old terminology for release time. That's the time in which the compressor takes to re- It's an old studio trick. Set back to normal. So we'll start with a quick release time or recovery time. And let's set the three. No matter what industry you are, there's always these old tricks. It's an old, it's an old cowboy trick. It's an old miner's trick. Play. Whoop. So I'm gonna look for something fairly subtle here to begin with, with a fast release time. On this unit, it classically was called recovery. This is, and let's set the threshold so that it's only taking a few decibels off the signal. switch that on and off you can hear that even with just the limiter in that's having an impact on the dynamics and then we'll move on to the compressor so if we have a look at the uh, I kind of wish you would just stop talking but it does sound good um it might be saturating that kick drum a little bit I could just barely tell I don't know if if they're trying to avoid playing the audio example but that sounded really good though um, regardless, I like the flavor. Ratio controls here. What this does is allow you to vary the amount of compression that is added after the threshold that you've set here. You can set a very subtle 1.5 to 1 compression ratio up to a more vary the amount of compression that is added after the threshold that you've set here. You can set a very subtle 1.5 to 1 compression ratio up to a more aggressive six to one ratio. And if I engage this now, you'll hear, I can, I can switch between those and you'll hear a, a very clear difference. Immediately you hear this second portion of the compressor kick in. That sounds really good. Um, the limiter's still on. He left it on. I don't know why. Uh, I, as a maker of videos, would prefer to demo one part 
and do it clean so that you can tell what's going on. I don't know if they intended to do that, but I mean, this is great video. I just think maybe you should have turned the limiter off. And I believe that the, the um, signal flow is going to this compressor first and then the limiter is after. Um, so that's why I would have probably attacked this demo a little bit differently, starting off with the compression part, but this sounds really, really nice. That's a 1.5 to 1. Here we go. Let's, let's dial some more aggressive compression in. And what you'll start to hear are some uh, distortions, uh, some non-linearities, and these are those juicy tones that good compressors generate. Something that's a really... Yeah, so keep in mind that this is probably a rented studio that makes it look super fancy, right? Associating this with a big console in the background. The drum track is a really good drum track. Now with that, if you just ignore all that, this thing, it really does sound good. There's some really nice chewiness and grabby type stuff. Um, I'm listening to that kind of release. Um, I like how it's treating the attack of the drums. Okay? But just keep in mind that it's really nice drum track. Okay? It's like really, really high end. So... The underrated feature that's available on this unit is the ability to bypass not only each section individually, but there is a global true bypass allowing you to switch the machine on and off and have a signal continue to pass through so you can AB. So with the true bypass... I don't know why we have to explain the bypass. I, I saw that part before, it was just like, I, I don't understand exactly why it's um, significant, um, but it's good to have. Non-linearities that the classics do in those subtle distortions they add. So let's listen to something different through this. Let's, let's put some guitar through this, a very nice little acoustic piece, just something subtle, something different to the drums. What we don't want the compressor to do is distort this in any way. So everything's gonna be set differently to the way the drums were, but the process is still the same. I'm gonna start with the limiter this time. I'm going to engage this and set this so that it's barely working at all. What you do have, interestingly, and unique to this design, is this automated section in the recovery times. A1 and A2 are program dependent recovery times. So they are in fact listening to the material and responding to it. I thought he was talking about AI for a second there. So if we move across to the compressor section, and again in this instance, this needs to be applied far more subtly. We don't wanna hear any distortions on this delicate track. We'll engage that. So if we start with the ratio low and set the threshold so that the needles just start to catch and already I can hear the effect. So again, we have a variable attack time which is available. So this guy is really good. I mean, it's a really good demonstration. Um, so I, I don't want to come across as just like ripping apart this video. This might be a little louder though when it kicks on. Um, might be. But again, it's really hard to like manage these things when you're in the middle of trying to talk about something and then actually get it right. Um, and another kind of side note is if somebody's not using headphones, then they have to have a way to cut the dialogue mic um, to have the speakers on. So uh, like in my videos here, I want to be able to hear my monitors so I don't have to wear headphones when I film. So again, like sometimes in presentations, you'll see that the person doing the video may not even be able to run their monitors because they don't have stuff set up to actually kill the dialogue mic when the signal is coming out of the speakers. Uh, that's why we have people wearing headphones. And sometimes I've even seen it where people, it's just obviously they can't even hear what, what it's doing. <laughs> They're just kind of looking at the meters in a quiet room. Um, so yeah, I don't know if maybe the headphones um, don't make it as obvious, but yeah, the level seems close. Maybe it's a little louder on the, the wet than the dry, but um, anyways, let's get back to it. On the switches over here. The slower will, as we said before, allow more of the transient information through, more of the pick. 
or deal with the pick if it's too much, if you set it too fast. And then again, with the true bypass. That sounds really good. I'm not hearing any like tone sucks on it. Like you don't hear any like high end disappear necessarily, but you hear it getting stronger, which is good. So I don't have any complaints. So why don't we put a whole mix through this? When you start with the limiter, you can deal with the spiky transients and that feeds into the compressor, which then gives you the gluing control that brings the whole mix together. Again, I think this is where this dual mono as opposed to stereo feature will come into its own with the complexity of. So, you know, that's interesting because I was just talking to my friend, um, Eric Stratton about this. Um, he, uh, he was having an issue with um, a compressor not linking together in the channels, and I was encouraging him to actually send out mid-side to external gear. And that way you don't even have to worry about stereo linking. Um, you have mid on the first channel and side on the second channel, and you get perfect stereo matching that way. So you could actually do this dual mono, use mid-side on your stereo bus. And honestly, that'd be a pretty cool approach. That can do stuff that some of my other compressors like the successor can't do. You know, the successor, it's going to just be stereo linked. You can't do like a dual mono. A mix, you've got lots of different information in the left and right signals. And if the compressor is responding in stereo with both sides working together, that can make things sound a little uneasy. And in dual mono mode, there's the left side being compressed independently to the right side, as well as being detected independently. Automated response times are going to be really practical here. Lower compression settings may be a little more generous than we had before, because sometimes they can add in more punch. Just pull that back a bit further. So in this mode, on the full mix, you can really hear this unit having such an impact. Yeah, it does sound good. It, it is one of the hardest things to do is to just slap on a compressor on a mix because you adjust the mix according to what the compressor is doing. And so you'll hear it kind of kick in on that kick drum there, that doom, doom, and you can see the needles jump. It, you know, it's, it's a little aggressive, kind of like the 33609 is, you know, but sounds good. We can really hear how much impact we've had on this overall mix. On this overall mix. Really hear how much impact we've had on this overall mix. That's a cool track. So there you have it, the Behringer 369. Why integrate the 369? They give you a much more tangible, creative, authentic vibe. That's a pretty cool video. Um, I like this guy. Um, yeah. So I think it's worth checking out. Um, you know, what I do? Did I break YouTube? I think it's worth checking out. I mean, it seems interesting for $500, is that what it was? It's not bad. So yeah, um, I'd be curious to hear it in person if I could hear it in person, but if you need an outboard compressor, I mean, it's hard to beat. Yeah, it's hard to beat. So, yeah, I don't know. Thoughts, questions, comments? You think this was stupid? Uh, if you thought this was cheesy or lame, I won't do another video like this. Uh, but I just figured, hey, why not? But, uh, yeah, that's kind of what goes on in my mind uh, when I see something like this. I think outboard is a lot of times so much better, even if it's the budget outboard, 
than plugins. And you'll find that. So even this, um, as long as the quality control is good, as long as there's no noise issues, you know, things like that, this could be this could be really really cool. So yeah, let me know if you have any questions, thoughts. See ya.